The land and the First Nation people in Canada who have lived on it for thousands of years have a unique bond. The land doesn't just provide sustenance and shelter. It's part of the culture of First Nations. It's part of the First Nations identity. Protecting it, nurturing it, and conserving it are both a way of life and necessary for life, and they're becoming more and more difficult in today's society. As First Nation communities try to meet these challenges, a pattern of seven essential elements of successful environmental governance has emerged. First Nations balance economic development with environmental protection and management by using approaches that are based upon their cultures. I think you can, you can have a development without, without destroying everything. First Nations leaders have strong, clear ecological priorities, and both the community and outsiders respect their authority. Stable institutions to address environmental issues are in place in the communities and their actions reflect the will of the community and the needs of the environment. First Nations make it a priority to gain access to all necessary information about environmental issues regarding their lands. First Nations and their institutions build their own capacity to conduct environmental research and analyze their own information, whether it's from Western science or traditional knowledge perspectives or both. First Nations have the administrative structures to effectively and efficiently implement the mandates of their institutions. And the final, and perhaps most important element, is having or finding financial resources to build capacity by bringing community members together with outside expertise, providing training and education, and building community infrastructure. Of course, we've got to watch as we, the land is taken care of. In Environmental Governance at Work, we'll visit the Carrier Sakani Tribal Council in Prince George, British Columbia, and show you how they've put these seven elements to work to deal with challenges they face because of mining and pipeline developments and the mountain pine beetle epidemic. And for First Nations, the entire process of environmental governance begins in the community. As First Nations work towards successful environmental governance, bringing members of the community together is the first step, even before any of the seven elements are put to work. I'd like to welcome everyone to the first annual University of Northern British Columbia Platelington A. Tawa. The people of the eight First Nations that comprise the Carrier Sakani Tribal Council have lived in this north central BC area since well before time immemorial. Their traditions are deep, their love for the land even deeper. And as the challenges of managing their environment grow more frequent and more complex, the commitment of the people on the land has grown stronger. Sophie Thomas is a 94-year-old medicine woman from the Saikus First Nation who embodies that spirit and passes down her love and knowledge of the land to those around her. Yen. Yen. Yen, everybody's tears. You have to respect the land like you respect your body. If the land dies, then you go next. The teaching that we, we received from our elders from early on, from being young, was to take care of the land and, and, and everything on it. You know, everybody calls it resources because it becomes a commercial commodity, but everything on the land um, we took we had a responsibility to take care of it and the simple philosophy behind it is that if you take care of it, it will take care of you. That it's like your mother, it will keep you warm, it will feed you, it will clothe you. And, and that was the idea behind it and that was a relationship that existed. When I was growing up, yeah, there wasn't a, as many people as there is now. But. Uh, 
We were taught, uh, you know, like to, to take care of the area around us. Good afternoon, Carrier Sakani Tribal Council. The Carrier Sakani Tribal Council, or CSTC, was formed more than 20 years ago, and the council brings together the voices of eight British Columbia First Nations. And this is what it looks like after I boil it. Minnie Thomas is Sophie's daughter and also a medicine woman, and she says First Nations must come together to be heard. We all work with one another, defend one another when things are going to, to destroy what you have, like the pipeline was going to go through here and our people went through all the parts of Karasakani to let them know what was happening to put a stop to it. A strong voice through, through uh, you know, like uh, more bands involved together. Eh? I think any um, resource development proposal needs the feedback of the community members. Each First Nation of the Carrier Sakani has its own band council and its own decision-making process. Bringing a band's individual interests and expertise into CSTC is what makes the tribal council strong. In turn, the council stands behind each member nation, helping them to become better stewards of their territories. That bond among the seven, eight nations uh, currently um, associated with the tribal council realize that there is strength in numbers, uh, whether, you deal, whether you're dealing with uh, governance issues or resource uh, proposals by any of the companies or the governments. The Balancing Act required of First Nations extends beyond economics and the environment. Successful governance means combining traditional ways with Western systems. The Ballat or Potlatch and KO systems of authority have been used throughout the Carrier Sakani territory for hundreds of years. Passed down through the mother's side of the family, the hereditary Keho holder is expected to be familiar with the use of the land in their territory and protect the land for the hereditary chief in the region. Keho holders expect to be recognized as an authority on their own land by others, including industrial and commercial interests. This is a critical unifying force among the CSTC communities. In our case, the institutions would be our hereditary system of authority, our potlatch system. These have We've, we've inherited those from our ancestors. They've been with us for, for countless generations and we still stand with them. They're fundamentally important to who we are, uh, fundamentally important in our relationships to each other, fundamentally important to our relationship to the land. So we, um, we, we pay great attention to, to that system of authority. The KO and potlatch systems are now being recognized by industry and non-First Nation governments as traditional authority systems that need to be considered in all stages of proposed development. But the challenge isn't just getting outside interests to respect these systems, it's re-energizing them from within, after years of Western influence eroding how First Nations people embrace their own traditions. There was a direct attack by the government on the fundamental institutions of our of our people, our families, through the residential school system and our potlatch system, our lawmaking and authority system in our territories through our potlatch or our feast system. And, you know, those, we maintain those. They're not as strong as they, they were once, but um, we have the foundation to rebuild on it, and which is what we're doing now. The member nations of the Carrier Sakani Tribal Council speak with one voice to address some of their greatest environmental challenges in a culturally relevant way. This voice would prove to be critical to deal with a proposed mine, an oil and gas pipeline development, and the mountain pine beetle epidemic.